Warning, the following podcast contains words. If you get offended by them, that's kind of on you. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by Hymns, ZipRecruiter, and by Don Jr.'s new reality show, Adderall in the Family. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, I'm Amy. And I'm John. And I'm Taylor. Despite the fact that we three work for one of the largest school districts in Florida, and that our clientele is often unevolved, we can assure you that we did, in fact, evolve from filthy monkey men. And and women. It's August 27th. And it's National Banana Lover's Day. It's also my birthday, but no, that's cool. Go with that. That's great. I great. Have no illusions. I'm Elon Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. It's my fucking birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and from Joe Rogan's New Jersey, Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we've got just the way to tell your Scorpio baby he's an asshole. <laughs> Donald Trump gets negged by God in his own <laughs> fantasy. And that $10.5 million cushion fucks up my Jerry Fall poorly joke. <laughs> but first, the diatribe. I will never understand how Christians can convince themselves of their own moral superiority or even their own morality, right? Like theirs is a system where you can become absolved of all sin by silently apologizing to yourself. Or if we want to be more generous, by apologizing to a mythical character that by definition is obligated to accept your apology and love you no less for your transgression. Jesus doesn't even demand that you rectify the problem or even that you apologize to whomever you might have slighted with your sinfulness. He asks only that you confess of your sin, at which point he's duty bound to fully absolve you. That's the whole point. What's more, he doesn't even expect you to stop sinning afterwards. He knows fully well that you're going to fall short again. And when you do, he'll be ready to forgive that transgression as well. Jesus comes with infinite get out of jail free cards. And if you think that you can do moral philosophy that bad for 2000 years without getting really shitty morality, I'd ask you to simply look at any Christian institution that has existed for any time period anywhere ever. All right, let's start with the oldest, the Catholic Church. Yes, they raped a bunch of kids, but they said they were sorry, right? They're going to make an earnest effort to do better in the future. But hey, they're flawed descendants of Eve living in a fallen world after all. So they're not going to do perfect. And Jesus stands ready to forgive them the next time they do it, too. And since theirs is a forgiveness based morality, there's no need for recompense. Right. There's no point in releasing the suspected pedophiles that they're still harboring in their quasi state of child rapist stand. Right. There's no reason to release the victims from the non-disclosure agreements that their financial compensation was contingent on. There's no reason to proactively give up the names of every little suspected pedophile to law enforcement. As long as everybody's admitted to their sins and sincerely apologized to Jesus, they're in the clear from an ethical perspective. In fact, all these minor reforms and reporting requirements and shit, that's just altruism icing on the said sorry, can't get mad cake, if you think about it. Or, or, or how about we look at the second biggest denomination in the U.S., the Southern Baptist Convention. What, what is Southern Baptism anyway? Does the water spin the other way when you drain the baptismal font or something? No, it's fucking slavery. Right. I like in the lead up to the Civil War, the Baptists in the South decided that they couldn't be friends with those abolitionist assholes in the North anymore. So they split off and made their very own baptism with hookers and slavery. Not, not only did the fucking Southern Baptists come into existence to provide theological justification for slavery and white supremacy, but that's also what they continued to do for at least a century after the Civil War. One could argue that's still what it does, but at the very fucking least, that's what it was doing into the 60s, providing theological justification for white supremacy. A couple of years ago, the Southern Baptist Seminary, the, the oldest seminary affiliated with the SBC, tried to confront their racist origins with a report called The Report on Slavery and Racism in the History of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And to their credit, 
it more or less did lay out their bigoted origins and their central role in justifying slavery, segregation, and white supremacy. It, it, more or less, more or less. They, they released this report in 2018, and they said they were super sorry, right? And they, they did a whole thing on a stage where they had a black guy come on and accept her apology on behalf of African Americans. And, and that was that, morally cleansed by Christian standards. Of course, it's not like this legacy we're talking about is like thousands of years ago. They are still directly benefiting from this today. Like, for example, with their hundred million dollar endowment almost universally donated to further the goal of maintaining the racist status quo. So a, a nearby historically black college said, hey, if you guys are really sorry, right, how about you tithe 10 percent of that racism fortune that you still have to us or to some other method of black empowerment? And the Southern Baptist Seminary was like, fuck you. We already said we were sorry. And that was that. Right. Did you not hear the guy who accepted our apology? Like, despite Christian claims to the contrary, universal forgiveness is not a fucking virtue and pretending otherwise is a vice. It's a bullshit bit of blame jujitsu. Yes, I'm the one who did something wrong, but I said I was sorry, which is good. You didn't accept my apology, which is bad. Therefore, we're both bad in this story and you were bad last. In fact, this philosophy doesn't even require that I give you back your money as long as I've apologized to you for stealing it. So even temporarily withholding acceptance of my apology to see if anything's going to change is bad or at least fall short of the ideal good. You should forgive me universally like Jesus would. And if you don't, that's really a problem with your ethics and not mine. Be more Christian. Is it any fucking wonder that people spoon fed that shit their whole lives? Think that African-Americans are being greedy when they talk about reparations or affirmative action or any act whatsoever to help rectify the enormous imbalance of power that results from our nation's multi-century history of white supremacy? I mean, white people already said they were sorry after all. Okay, Christianity is not a good source of morality. Hell, it isn't even a bad source of morality. It is a shortcut around morality, and it always has been. Uh, incidentally, by the way, this diatribe is very much inspired by a book I'm reading called White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity by Robert P. Jones. Normally, I would not recommend a book I'm not done with yet, but if this is a topic you want to explore more, at least the first half of this book is really fucking good. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the huff and puff to my blow, Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to frighten some piggies? I'm thinking we got to team up with those angry birds. The pigs hate them. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, and I've said this isn't about pigs. This is about ethics in housing journalists. <laughs> Topical. Thank you. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Well done. And on that note, we're going to pause for a quick word from our first sponsor this week, Hems. All right. Roll your attack roll. Okay. 14. Ooh, that is a success. So long, luxurious locks burst from your head. Nice. Awesome. Hey, guys. What you doing? Oh, uh, we're playing this new version of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, yeah. What's it like? Uh, mostly you have magic spells that grow your hair. And you wash it yeah. sometimes. Yeah, you do. Ugh, fantasy. Fantasy, yeah. Guys, why don't you just try 4 com? Is that a Pathfinder mod? Because I barely got Heath into 5th edition. I don't know. No, 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 no. 4 com is a one-stop shop for hair loss, skin care, and sexual wellness for men. It's time to write a new chapter, one in which you have hair. A website for hair loss? Why don't you just tell me you figured out a reasonable min-max for a tortle rogue? What? It's a hard thing. I don't believe you is what I meant. Well, you should. For Hims is helping guys be the best version of themselves with licensed medical providers and FDA-approved products to help treat hair loss. No snake oil pills or gas station counter supplements. Prescription solutions backed by science. All right, Noah, that sounds great, but... I'm not exactly looking to go to a store and buy stuff right now. Well, with 4 you don't have to. No more awkward in-person doctor's visits or long pharmacy lines. 4 connects you to licensed medical professionals online, which could save you hours. Plus, it's completely confidential and discreet. Just answer a few quick questions, a medical professional will review, and if they determine it's right for you, they can prescribe you medication to treat hair loss that is shipped directly to your door. Wow, that does sound good. Today, Hims is giving you their best offer yet. If you're not happy with your results after 90 days, Hims will give you a full refund. And right now, our listeners can get their first visit absolutely free. Go to forhims.com slash scathing. That's forhims.com slash scathing. 
Full refund of price paid available for the first 90-day supply. Refund request must be made between 90 and 180 days after product shipment delivered. Prescription products require an online consultation with a medical professional who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's forhims.com slash scathing. Thanks, Noah. We'll definitely check that out. All right, Heath, you ready? I roll for a front-facing fan facing Ooh, my face. Ooh, yes. I'm going to whip it back and forth. Yeah, you are. My hair. Uh-huh. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, the Democratic National Convention, Anna. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. The Democratic National Convention happened last week. <laughs> and we have some great news about that. Thanks to the Democratic Party, God is dead. Yep. We did oh. it. Yep. We can wrap it up now. People in charge of the event finally realized that Christianity is pretty much gone from the United States and atheism is super popular. <laughs> so they intentionally omitted the phrase one nation under God from the Pledge of Allegiance. No, they didn't. But according <laughs> to Donald Trump, they did. He also had yeah. a quote, rabble, rabble, rabble. <laughs> Okay, are we sure he isn't like an Ink Master type villain from George Orwell's trash? Because he acts like an Ink Master type villain from or George Orwell's trash. Yeah, no, this is entirely possible. I, I, I honestly, I can't tell if this validates the people who said, see, we had to put this much Jesus into it, or the people who said, see, it didn't matter how much Jesus you put into it. But, but they all took a victory lap around this. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what actually happened. They recited our creepy fascist pledge of allegiance to a rectangle of fabric mm -hmm. on all four nights of the convention. <laughs> and they included the phrase one nation under God all four of those times. But apparently there were two groups of Democrats who met during the day, not during the televised convention itself. And they left out the word God from the pledge. And both times it was because invoking Christian God would be super obnoxious, like beyond the normal amount that goes along with reciting wedding vows to a flag. <laughs> One of those two groups was the Muslim Delegates and Allies group, and the other was the LGBTQ caucus. Probably had something to do with Christian God explicitly wanting to murder all those people yeah. according to yeah. the Bible. Just yeah. guessing. Or translated out of reality into a Trump tweet, quote, the Democrats took the word God out of the Pledge of Allegiance at the Democrat National Convention. At first, I thought they made a mistake but it wasn't. It was done on purpose. Remember, evangelical Christians and all, this is where they're coming from. It's done. Vote November 3rd. Jesus. All right. Uh, who else am I doing bad with? Okay, got it, got it. Can't believe the Democrats got Long John Silvers instead of Popeyes for catering black people and all. This is where they're coming from. <laughs> Can't believe the Democrats chose Skippy peanut butter when choosy moms clearly choose <laughs> suburban chip. But my favorite freak out came from hate pastor and Keebler HR guy, Robert Jeffress. <laughs> According to Jeffress, Democrats talking about faith, it doesn't count because they weren't specific enough about the faith. Uh -huh. During an interview on Fox News, he said, quote, the Democrats talk about faith in some ethereal, undefined way, but they never define what that faith is. Is it faith in oneself? Faith in other people? Faith in the tooth fairy? Oh, oh they all said faith in God? <laughs> then you have to ask, which <laughs> God? The God of the Bible? They're pretty much all Christian? Uh, baby murder! Almost <laughs> exact quote. <laughs> Yeah, they had to cut away before he and his own sentence came to blows. <laughs> See, well, if there's anybody whose rhetoric could throw a chair at itself, yeah, it's Robert Jeffress. <laughs> Jesus. It'd be a folding chair and he'd have trouble with it. it right, kind of right. No, yeah, yeah we ended up handing him as he threw it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, circling back to the Pledge of Allegiance, just for the record, that was written, the, the version we know anyway, it was written in 1892 by a xenophobic Baptist minister from right near Eli's hometown in upstate New York. <laughs> ooh, ooh. And even that guy didn't include under God in that original version. We added that in 1954 so we could defeat all those godless communists using the, the power of kids talking in unison. So moral of the story, hate pastors from the 1800s are 
way too secular for Donald Trump and the GOP of 2020. <laughs> That's where we are. <laughs> oh, and in Taurus, a new one news. Nice. You know, if being a parent has taught me anything, it's that you really only need three hours of sleep a night and that the government is watching me through tiny cameras they placed inside my no, life. Eli, but, Eli, Eli, the story. Right, sorry, sorry. But the third thing I've learned is that there is no idea dangerous or stupid enough that someone won't try to sell it to you for your baby. Mm -hmm. From homeopathic cough medicine to attachment parenting, if you put sleep through the night by 11 weeks on the back, someone will buy it. And this week, we learned that we're stooping to brand new levels because Chronicle Books is releasing a series of astrology books for babies. <laughs> Look at that. Look, he shits like a cancer. Just, <laughs> just like that, actually. That's great. Well, I mean, but to be fair to astrologers, this is one of the few demographics that doesn't yet consistently see through their bullshit. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah I get that's it. That's fair. Now, to their credit, the publishers seem to take these books uh, about as seriously as we do. According to the article I read, quote, Harper said that with Chronicles books, parents will get to spend time thinking about a very broad version of a topic they like. And babies, meanwhile, will get bright colors, characters, narrative, and rhymes. Yeah, and quote. but my fucking horoscope never gave me bright colors or rhymes. Am I getting ripped off on this shit? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, either way, Heath and I know money when we smell it. So, Morgan, hit it. Namaste. I am Guru Bosnick. Namaste as well. I'm Guru and right. And we're the authors of the brand new series, Bullshit for Babies. Bullshit for Babies endeavors to introduce a brand new line of debunked, poisonous, and dangerous ideas to your baby's brain as early as possible. Like our first book, Peekaboo, Which Cast Are You? A fun and colorful guide to where and when your baby should cast a shadow. Or what about 123 Alchemy? A rhyming exploration of the transmutation of metals for the little Newton in your life. Or, why not try phrenology with friends? This story teaches the important... Guys, guys, you have to stop. Oh, come on, Noah. We're just trying to make some money. Yeah, what's the big deal? Well, Tony Perkins already put out that last book. You guys are going to get us sued. Oh, that's fair. Uh, okay, yeah. Good looking out. Good looking out. And then, oh my God, this is so amazing. I'm shocked it didn't break on a Thursday morning news. Everybody else <laughs> is watching Jerry Falwell Jr. get fucked. And that's weird, right? <laughs> I'm not sure if he's like unjerking off to that or, or what. I, I don't know. How, he's course. going lefty. I okay. Know. I yeah. going. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So last week we learned that he'd be placed on indefinitely from Liberty U for accidentally blackmailing himself in reverse by voluntarily posting compromising photos of himself online. And then this week we learned that he's being placed on even less definite leave, I guess, for a thing I'm pretty sure we have neither word nor phrase for, actually. <laughs> the English language failed. I'm going to go with insufficiently devout cuckery, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah. Imagine being one of the kids who got kicked out of Liberty University for watching an R-rated movie. Yes. And then you read this story in the <laughs> fucking paper. <laughs> or even worse, imagine being one of the kids who graduated. Yeah, yeah, that's, that is worse. Has oh, a degree and, now from Liberty University. Reading a story, come on, that's that's a little hard to picture. <laughs> um, so look, we're not going to kink shame on this show. If you get off watching other people fuck your spouse, great, have fun with that. Judging by the fact that five out of six trending videos on Pornhub involve fucking a step something, that seems pretty mild to me. But yes, according to they're John not related. All <laughs> right, right now. Well, Why? According to Why? Giancarlo <laughs> Granda. Uh, it turns out the Falwells were not taking their 20-something pool boy around on vacation for entirely platonic reasons like they said they were. According huh. to both A, Granda's assertions, and B, the text messages and other evidence reviewed by Reuters, <laughs> Granda and Jerry's wife, quote, developed an intimate relationship and Jerry enjoyed watching from the corner of the room, end <laughs> quote. Okay, why? Why are the Why are the cucks always in the corner right? of the room? Like, I feel like I'd want to get in close. If, if that was my thing, I'd want to check out angles and get see like the... buttholes and 
Whatever. <laughs> Two things, very important. The first is, imagine being the guy at Reuters where the guy was like, and you're going to want to see these naked pictures of me fucking Jerry Falwell's <laughs> wife, right? And you, as a reporter, have to be like, yeah, uh, that's, that is Yeah, you. go ahead and show me yeah, those no, that's pictures. News. That's, that is news. That's my that job. is part of my job. Oh. <laughs> and two, can we just admit cucks deserve better PR? Yes. Right? I mean, first <laughs> it was everyone who disagreed with the Nazis. Now it's Jerry Falwell. I, inviting someone else to have sex with your partner is downright neighborly. You know who was probably a cuck? Mr. Rogers, because he <laughs> believed in sharing. That's what we should. He did. He did. Yeah. So, of course, Falwell denied all of this, issuing a statement to right wing propaganda mill, the Washington Examiner, the day before the Reuters article was coming out, claiming that Granda had been blackmailing him for years over a relationship that Granda had with his wife. Which isn't how blackmail works. <laughs> Dude, without a hostage, there's no <laughs> ransom. That's what ransom is. Those are the fucking rules. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to tell you about the... Wait, hold on. I'll now, tell now, Walter your Walter Sobchak explain this to you? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> so in an amazing doth protest too much moment, Falwell's statement that came out before this article actually says that his wife, quote, had an inappropriate personal relationship with this person Something in which I was not involved, end oh. quote. <laughs> well, because you know how normally you have to explain whether or not you were a participant in your spouse's <laughs> affair? It's like that. <laughs> Becky Falwell could not be reached for comment as she has not yet emerged from under that bus. You, you know he got off that phone call and Becky was like, I'm with you no matter what. We're going to make it through this together. And he was like, hey, I'm glad you say that. <laughs> <laughs> Quick change of plan. <laughs> New strategy. You are the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and in Bible Peace Theater is coming to life news. Do you like <laughs> cut that shit out? Oh, no. With all this economic turmoil resulting from the global pandemic, Donald Trump had a meeting with the invisible hand who guides the market last week. His name is God. Mm -hmm. And during a rally in Minnesota, Trump explained how that meeting with God went. So fucking insane. It's, in, it's insane. so crazy. According to Trump, he was a little too braggy with God during that meeting about the amazing economy that Trump created out of nothing but Obama's amazing economy. So <laughs> God created COVID-19 as a test to see if Trump could fix it again. And apparently he has. Oh, so, well, there you, you know, mission accomplished. Uh, seems a little broad for Bible Peace Theater. I mean, could he maybe wave around a dead body? Do a musical number. You know, where, 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 just, no, this could do. This was in Minnesota. This wasn't on Fifth Avenue. Way yeah. around a dead body. Come on. <laughs> so I'm really not exaggerating about Trump's claim here. In his own made up story about speaking to the God of the universe, he was such an arrogant asshole that God had to challenge him with a plague for spite. <laughs> Here's the exact words we got from Trump. Quote, God said to me, you know, you did it once. And I said, did I do a great job, God? I'm the only one who could do it. They're talking about the economy here, about fixing mm -hmm. the economy that he was handed that was great. Good. A little small talk with God. Continuing. God said, that you shouldn't say. You shouldn't say you're the only one who could do it. Now we're going to have to make you do it again. I said, okay, I agree. You got me. But I did it once, and now I'm doing it again. <laughs> and then God offered me a low five, but I was too slow. I am very <laughs> humble. Please vote That's for exactly me, what this people. is. Yeah, there's, there's like, you, the Christians want you to be more humble, and this is where he went with it. When I was chatting with God one on one the other day. Yep. That's what happened. The crowd loved it, too. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Trump also added some absurd nonsense about his fantastic work on the environment and also the amazing unemployment numbers that he's working with right now. What? Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'll sort of try to explain here. Just for the record, the environmental thing, that was a conservation bill proposed by a Democrat and backed by Democrats mostly that Trump only signed because two GOP senators told him it would help him with their reelection campaigns. And I guess Trump got a little too braggy about that one too. So God made him try to read the word Yosemite during a speech about it. That was a fail. But the economy test is going great, according to Trump. After the remark about God teaching him humility, Trump added, and you see the kind of numbers we're putting up. Best 
job numbers ever. Three months, more jobs in the last three months than ever before. Well, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The media is so busy bitching about the fact I burned down the house that none of them even bothered to thank me for getting rid of the mildew in the upstairs bathroom yet. <laughs> There's no termites either, by the way. <laughs> well, not in the burn part. So, yeah, <laughs> just, just to review, again, this is... Trump's own fantasy story. (laughs) He talked with God and God found him off-putting, which led to a plague in his story. Right, yeah, no, by his own account, if he'd been less snitty with God, 170,000 more people would be alive in the U.S. alone. Yeah, and that plague caused our unemployment rate to jump from about three and a half, four percent to about 15, 16 percent. And now it's back down to like 10 percent And that's what Trump calls best job numbers ever. We have a president who doesn't even know what direction to lie in when he lies. You got to look at it per job, though, per job. Amazing. And even worse, we have an electorate that doesn't even understand what I just said. Yeah. They they just heard the word God in his thing and they started clapping. Yeah. He He talked to him. And in pee-pee mistakes news. Okay, podcast listener, are you biting down on something? All right. Well, if the answer was yes, that's weird. You should spit that out. Drop it. Drop it. Okay. Now put it back into your mouth. Eli, what? what are sorry. You doing? Sorry. I was just getting him ready uh, right. for this news. All right. Everybody ready? Televangelist, convicted felon, and freeze dried food product huckster Jim Baker received between $650,000 and $1.7 million Jesus. in PPP oh. loans this past June. I wasn't from the United down States government. On anything. Great. Now he only owes the IRS about $5 million. Wait, no, the whole thing is illegal that he just pulled off. Now it's back above the $6 million he's owed since 1994 when he got released from jail. Yeah. Yep. Great. So there is good news. Regular listeners to the show will know that birds got to fly, fish got to swim, and Jim Baker has to commit fraud, which <laughs> is why at the start of the COVID crisis in the U.S., he almost immediately started selling fake cures for it, which it turns out, is illegal. And it's illegal even if your regular pitch is buy my buckets or you'll have nowhere to poop when the horse scorpion locust hit you. <laughs> so uh, there's an ongoing lawsuit about that. Yeah, I'm not that confident about how these lawsuits are going to go. Like, sincerely held lying is basically the cornerstone of the John Roberts Supreme Court. So yeah. if it gets high enough, <laughs> yeah, it's the going theme that. that ties it all together. And let's keep in mind that he spent years saying his silver water could cure all venereal diseases without anybody ever saying shit. So, like, saying that stuff is illegal selectively, if anything. Yeah, it's, it's got to be out of the charts, I guess. So, yeah, you're actually not allowed to use your PPP loan for crimes, it turns out. So, oh, okay. according to the Associated Press, quote, After the fact, the Small Business Administration will review organizations and companies to identify those that may have submitted inaccurate self-certifications. The agency may seek repayment with the potential for civil or criminal penalties if a fraudulent application was submitted. Oh, okay. But again, the problem with Baker isn't that nobody's seeking repayment, right? (laughs) (laughs) And according to attorney Daniel Grooms, a former federal prosecutor who worked in the Justice Department for 15 years, quote, there is every reason to think that an entity led by a person with the profile he has, given his history and given the ongoing fraud issues surrounding the product he was selling, that those ongoing investigations and the ongoing attention, it would be realistic to think that would lead to further investigation of his PPP loans. End oh, quote. the investigations are going to lead to more investigations. Boy, you can tell that <laughs> motherfucker has worked as a federal prosecutor against <laughs> churches before, right? Yep. That's how it'll go. So, yeah, a fake COVID cure, a stroke. Now might have to come up with $1.7 million for Uncle Sam. I think it's safe to say it's been a bad year for Jim Baker, but that means it's been a good year for the rest of us. Yeah, well, better. Anyway, better. I feel better about that. Yeah, he's having a bad year. You're right. No, I, I smiled a little bit. I did. There you go. I did. All right. And finally tonight, in the devil's in the detail news, Tennessee pastor, rehabilitator of witness tampering felons and donut vigilante Greg Locke extended his record for consecutive weeks with a scathing atheist headline consideration by noticing that if you turn the logo for the Democratic National Convention on its side and then 
draw a satanic symbol over it, it looks exactly <laughs> like a satanic symbol. <laughs> Which so means stupid. that Greg was like taking random democratic symbols and drawing over them and Cran being like, I'm about to blow this shit wide open. Yes. <laughs> All right. Still haven't found anything yet. I'm going to find something. Let me just let me just lay down on my side for a second. Take a rest. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. I got him. So the symbol in question is known colloquially as a star. Or if you want to freak out, Christian's a pentagram. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to be a verbose math nerd about it, I just learned this. An isotoxal, non-intersecting, concave polygon. Sorry, there's, there's not much to this story. I have to make the word count somehow. Anyway, Got it's it. literally just a goddamn star. But that didn't stop hate Pastor Greg Locke from tweeting out a picture of it, rotated 90 degrees next to a shot of the goat pentagram symbol with this actual observation. Quote, I suppose it's just a coincidence that the hashtag Dem Convention logo turned sideways is the exact same design and measurements as another familiar logo. Measurements? S yep. <laughs> Satanism is alive okay. and well. End quote. <laughs> okay. I love that he thinks two images have the same measurements because they both fit on his computer screen. Yeah, right, like exactly. In his head. They're both and they're not even the same. Thing. Like, he photoshopped them together, and they're not even the same size, the two stars. That's amazing. Hey, right, no, they're both 125%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, unrelated, the Dunkin' Donuts logo looks like boobs, so, you know, keep an eye on those guys. Just saying. <laughs> some boobs in their logo. Now, obviously, the good folks on Twitter were quick to help Lock decode some other sideways and upside-down satanic symbols like all them little devils hiding in the American flag or all those <laughs> devil worshippers that play for the Cowboys and all those okay, satanic valid. little kids who did so well on spelling bees. Most also noteworthy, valid. perhaps, were the three stars in the GOP elephant, which don't even have to be rotated <laughs> to point downwards. <laughs> now, Locke has not responded to any of these points, though, most likely because he's hiding in a closet from a plushie of Patrick from SpongeBob. Uh, yeah. would be my guess. And uh, I guess we're going to wrap the headlines on that lovely image. So, Heath, Eli, thanks as always. Flumanji. And when we come back, the opiate of the masses gets a rebuttal. You wanted to see me, Mr. President? Tyler, Tyler, get in here, big guy. You remember Mesopotamia and Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Hello, Tyler. Sarah, why are you still here? Squatters rights, you know this. But, but you never lived here. Says you, maybe. Oh. Anyway, we're working on mesothelioma's big speech, and we want to make sure we hired the best people for the Republican National Convention. Well, why not try ZipRecruiter? What's ZipRecruiter? ZipRecruiter is the smartest way to hire. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job sites, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and actively invites them to apply to your job. And how do we choose people for the RNC? We hired whoever kissed a cardboard cutout of you the most passionately. Oh, nice. Who won? Uh, Don Jr. That tracks. ZipRecruiter makes the entire hiring process efficient and effective with features like screening questions to filter our candidates and an all-in-one dashboard where you can review and rate your candidates. So we could have put a screening question like, are you about to tweet a long and openly anti-Semitic conspiracy theory before your appearance? Exactly. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Plantage? One day, yes. And right now, to try ZipRecruiter for free, our listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G. ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Quig is wang ang says to do today. How was that? I, maybe I got a word or two? A little bit, maybe. I got all of it. Really? You could understand her? What? No, no, I found a Mars bar wrapper under the couch. Okay. All mine, stop looking. If there's one group of people who consistently prey on the minds of children, a group who all good parents must remain vigilant against, 
It's those damn commies. And no, we haven't been transported back into the 1950s. Only our thinking has with this month's selection from Hillary Morgan Ferrer's Mama Bear Apologetics. <laughs> yes, the time has come for a chapter I have been looking forward to since I looked at this book's table of contents on Amazon. <laughs> chapter 13, Communism Failed Because Nobody Did It Right, Marxism. Okay, for the record, as wrong as I'm sure Hillary's about to get everything, she's right about how shitty that argument is, communists. Just so. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta seize the means of production godfully. Yeah. So the good news is even Hillary is going to admit at the start of this chapter that she has no fucking idea why she's talking about Marxism in a Christian apologetics book oh, okay. about protecting about your kids ask. from thinking. Yeah, but damn it. Marxism is just too big a threat to ignore. Yeah. Yeah. This right here is where it gets ridiculous right now. Uh, yeah. The, the chapters about naturalism, moral relativism, and pluralism, they, they were all right in her intellectual wheelhouse. <laughs> this is <she's> stretching, <laughs> I think. Here's her quote about it. Quote, up until recently, my thoughts were, isn't communism a thing of the past? USSR? Berlin Wall? Have we learned nothing about the errors and evils of Marxism? And isn't Venezuela learning this lesson, like, right now? <laughs> what? Spoiler alert, no. Apparently, we have not learned this lesson. End quote. Yeah, the drop in the market price for oil is really teaching Venezuela about the pitfalls of Marxism. <laughs> <laughs> also, 18% of the humans are Chinese. Does she not know about them? <laughs> I don't think... She does. Uh, but don't worry. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. <laughs> don't worry. She's going to get to it because it turns out that Hillary Morgan Ferrer knows why communism has never worked out. You guys huh. ready? No, absolutely not ready. Yeah. Quote. Reject whatever is about to happen. <laughs> when you read Marxist literature, you'll notice it completely ignores original sin and human nature. Oh, Jesus fucking what? Christ. <laughs> Marxism <laughs> could theoretically work as long as you don't have those two little factors at play. Good luck with that, end yeah. quote. Yeah, Stalin was crushing it, but then some lady handed him an apple and the whole thing just unraveled. <laughs> well, now, to be fair, things would have gone way better for him had we lacked knowledge of good and evil. So. Yeah, that's fair. That's true. Now, if you're wondering who the insidious forces pushing Marxism on your children are, why, that would be Teen Vogue. What the fuck is happening? She references a 2018 article that explains the basic ideas of Marxism versus capitalism. <laughs> In Teen Vogue. Yep. Feels like Teen Vogue probably isn't the best source for that topic. But, you know, then again, here we are talking about Hillary Morgan Ferrer's chapter about Marxism <laughs> versus capitalism. All right, yeah. So it's all relative. Yeah. Here's what she has to say about that article. Quote, back in my day, we learned about the latest lip gloss colors and laughed over readers submitted most embarrassing moments. End quote. But... <laughs> I consumed materials that didn't teach me things. The author of this book, <laughs> Jesus right. fucking Christ. So now we go to a section insultingly titled, Why Are We Talking About Failed Economic Policies in a Book for Moms? Great question. This is not the first time one of our editor's margin notes made it into the final draft, guys. <laughs> yeah, but she's going to lose a big chunk of her audience right up at the front of this section when she says, quote, I want to say right now that the Bible is not pro-capitalism and America is not God's chosen nation. Who's a record wow. needle scratch? <laughs> Dude, read the room. Right? It's like us opening up a section of our show about how bald and a goatee is a really bad look. <laughs> just, just saying <laughs> not, to our audience. It's a great look. Great look. You look fantastic. So yeah. She Sweaty explains, hugs are a really bad it. idea. Mm -hmm. So she explains that her problem is that Marxism is a religion. She spends like two paragraphs on this, so I guess it's horning in on her territory. Here's the quote. Marxism is more than just a failed economic policy. It is essentially religion, one that touches on every facet of life, from church to family to morality, end quote. It, it's like an opiate for itself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's basically saying like, if you turn stuff into a religion, it fucks up the Cut. <laughs> Cut in my book. Yeah. So now HMO is going to set us straight with a section titled 
what's the difference between Marxism, socialism, and communism? Or as I call it, Heath, are you biting down on something? Yeah. <laughs> Just copy tell. I've got a copyright. <laughs> Each heading has a Satan outline that's a little more full. Or <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Hillary's answer, despite that title, seems to be, meh, they're all pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Because, you know, they're all coming for your Bible, according to her. Right, yeah. According to her section on socialism, she says, quote, socialism can coexist with freedom of religion, but it generally promotes secularism, a radical separation of church and state where religious ideas are welcome only in the private realm of hearth and home. Communism, on the other hand, is unapologetically atheistic. (laughs) From each according to his ability... To each, God is dead. Sorry, not sorry. (laughs) Yeah, I think I remember that from the book. She also goes on this great little communism rant here at the end of this section when she's explaining it. She says, quote, the people would collectively own all manufacturing, all commodities, and there would be no more classes of people, meaning that everyone would be perfectly equal. Sounds great, doesn't it? Unless you're like me and you remember how well this worked with high school group projects. I was the one who cared the most, so I ended up doing all the work. The idea of equality is great until you remember that it doesn't guarantee equality of motivation. But I digress. (laughs) End of real quote. I digress in my book. That's a group project. Well, right. Yeah, right. I feel like she took the name of the mommy blogger who said she'd write the communism chapter out of that sentence at the last minute. (laughs) It's like Sharon. Which brings us to a section called, so what do the Marxists think they are doing? Sneaking out of the house to go make out with Brad, apparently. (laughs) Yeah, close. She explains that the Marxists are so dedicated to their ideas, so single-minded that the end always justifies the means, no matter what evil they need to do to get rid of evil class systems. And that's why they must be stopped no matter what. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But in Christianity, the beginning justifies the Yes, it Uh, is, actually. She even points out that maybe, maybe, all the child labor of the 1700s wasn't awesome. Here's the quote. Quote, To play devil's advocate, Ah, throw the book. (laughs) Marx made some legitimate points in the Communist Manifesto about the abuses that occurred to workers during the Industrial Revolution, like how industrialization commoditized children for cheap labor. Unfortunately, despite improved working standards and government regulations, Ah, throw the book, (laughs) that (laughs) that have significantly reduced workplace abuse, Modern Marxists, socialists, and communists still portray all capitalism as evil and usually personified as the man. Yeah, capitalism doesn't get enough credit for all uh, all the regulations on capitalism. That was them, <laughs> too. And Christianity doesn't get enough credit either. For right? That, yeah, way. and on- honestly, neither does the man while we're at it. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but don't worry. She's going to defend capitalism in a way that is so t- it, it convinces me I wrote this book as a prank against heat. <laughs> but let's ask ourselves, is building a business bad? Say a person starts a business and eventually becomes successful enough to hire workers. These workers do not own the business. Rather, they work for the owner. Oh, work for them. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I got lost for a second. Yeah. <laughs> whose goal is not merely to create and sell at cost, but to create and sell for a profit. Oh, fuck. That's why they call them workers. I get it. Yeah. Profit. Mm-hmm. yeah. To make when, money. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> when that happens, the workers have job stability and the owner can expand <laughs> the business and hire more workers. This is capitalism 101, end quote. Yeah. You know, you nailed it. You nailed it. Yeah. Startups are, are known for great job stability. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe go ahead and enroll in Capitalism 102, though, if you get a chance, Hillary. Uh, that's when you learn to outsource those jobs to a country with child labor, use that extra money to hire lobbyists, and convince a bunch of pro-life idiots to vote for deregulation and tax cuts for rich people. Just that. Yeah. That's like, what might happen in 102. Why does so many self-appointed commentators on economics brag about how remedial their knowledge is, right? <laughs> I mean, like, you could be insanely ignorant on this topic and still say X doesn't instill us with much confidence. Is it supposed to? I think so. God yeah. damn it. Capitalism 101 that you just said. <laughs> <God. laughs> she continues, quote, 
Marx considered this process to be the exploitation of the workers because their efforts were not being equally traded for product. An equal trade would result in no surplus and thus no profit. Except to the workers. Okay. <laughs> According to capitalism, profit is good. Profit means that the owner can reinvest the money, grow the business, and ultimately hire more workers. More workers create more product, which then creates more profits. This is how one builds a business that, in turn, enables people to make a living and communities to grow. And Beautiful grow. analysis. Cool. Yeah, nailed it. The uh, the gun company's crushing it, and uh, so is the butter company. And those are the two things <laughs> in the universe, guns and butter. Done. End of story. No, yeah, no, it's, it's just Reaganomics 101. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just need <laughs> infinite growth. <laughs> going to fuck this gun barrel with this butter. <laughs> and look, Having a great day. Even with this sunny trickle-down theory, Hillary is afraid you might have just gone red at the thought of sharing. So now it's time to roar like a mother. Oh, he swear ahead of her. Yeah, mm. yes. So we're going to start by recognizing the message. And she's going to list all the problems with Marxism, starting with rejecting innate sin. And <laughs> her point here is that Marxism blames everything on capitalism. They say that capitalism is the cause of all evil in the world, which is, as she says, very silly to think. Right. No, that's ridiculous because the real cause, as we know, was that fruit whore. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She said that earlier. Yes. Fine. And she says it again here. The second problem with Marxism is recognizing oppression. Let me say that again. A problem she lists with Marxism is that it recognizes oppression. What? Or as she puts it, quote, this is called identity politics and is a strong theme in the politics sphere. Having an identity is now. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And now in the educational sphere, from kindergarten to university students, end quote. Yeah, Marxism leads to pluralism and then naturalism. And now you've killed God. This <laughs> book's really coming together. I think she's building chapter on chapter. Yeah, but that's not all. Marxists also emphasize justice and equality, scare quotes hers. Or as she puts it, quote, when Marxists talk about injustice, what they really mean is differences. Have you ever noticed how futuristic movies often portray people as all wearing identical jumpsuits? Disillusion of differences supposedly equals dissolution of inequality. What? Yeah, Marx and Engels were mostly focused on everyone being a gym teacher. Yeah. That <laughs> closet full of jumpsuits. Well, they were big into shiny onesies with a with a giant V across the front of them as yep. well, yeah. too. <laughs> so now it's time to O, offer discernment. And she's going to start by pointing out that Marxism is now put forward under the guise of social justice, who she actually calls SJWs in the book. Really? Really? Yeah. The aforementioned SJWs, quote, rightly identify areas in which we as a nation need to change, but they don't understand that the solutions they offer are grounded in Marxism. In their zeal for justice, they may not realize they are being used to further an unbiblical agenda, end quote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like Jesus said. Rich people can't get into heaven uh, unless, of course, they're providing liquidity in a frictionless market. But like most of them you know, aren't going to Well, that's right, because you need liquidity, obviously. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but to be fair, HMO doesn't want us thinking that SJWs have nothing to say. Uh, there is still racism, and she admits that, quote, I have friends of color who have told me stories that make me furious. They are not race baiters, and they haven't bought into identity politics. What? <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. She wrote that, and she looked back over, and she thought, you know what? My readers are going to go, I bet those N-words are making it up. I need to clear that up right away. <laughs> fucking wow. I have friends who are Jews, and they are not liars. They have very small <laughs> amounts of gold. Name, name one of them. <laughs> Jaime. Jaime. <laughs> Rosen. Berg. Rosen, Jaime Rosenberg? Jew. <laughs> <laughs> Dave <Yarmulkes>. she, um. <laughs> she even admits, she even admits that it might, might be hard to be a poor person in this country. Quote, when children do not feel safe in their homes, they often cannot mature emotionally and psychologically. Where I differ is that I don't think all these problems will go away by throwing money at them. End quote. Um, if it's not money... I wonder how she thinks being poor goes away. 
<laughs> uh, that's a weird one. I mean, I guess it's got to be guns or butter. But, uh, you know, those are both tricky. Those are the yeah. two things remaining. <laughs> so now we're going to A, argue for a healthier approach. And her argument, shocking, I know, is going to be, sure, we might have different amounts of money, but we're all the same under God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, genocide and stuff are bad, but we're all children of God. So stop asking for your lives to matter. Or as she says it, quote, if we make every tiny thing into an example of oppression, then the word loses its meaning and people become indifferent, end quote. Yeah. Or you could just read this book and be indifferent from the start. So, <laughs> great. Did she fix it? Yeah. Is it, is it fixed now in her head? So now we're going to R, reinforce through discussion, discipleship, and prayer. And three of these are fantastic. So here's how to reinforce this with your kids. For young children, one, Play the image of God game. This game helps children understand that we are all made in the image of God and reminds them of our shared humanity as opposed to focusing on differences. Anytime you encounter someone different from you, skin color, hair color, age, body shape, disease, mental state. This is going to go so badly. Ask your kids, apparently out loud, <laughs> is that person made in the image of God? <laughs> Instill our collective identity as image bearers of God, no matter what our difference is. Great, great. Bunch of little kids walking around fucking Florida, wherever her readership is. They're in the supermarket being like, Mom, I found a black guy. Let's play that game. Yeah. Let's play. <laughs> right, we play with right. the black guys. <laughs> hey, hey, kids, look at this diseased motherfucker here. The game, by the way, being pretend racism doesn't exist. The game, to be clear. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely wow. point at the guy at the wheelchair and be like, him too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Are you also black? This is perfect. Mom, mom, mom. <laughs> Please tell me you have a mental illness. <laughs> Dude, if you're gay, I'm about to get five fucking points and I will lose my mind. <laughs> so number two for middle school and high schoolers, she says, stay aware of buzzwords like justice, injustice, Equal and unequal. Yeah, you've got to be nervous words. when your kids start talking about that kind of shit. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Ask your teens to define what is unjust, just, or unequal about a given situation. Oh, we're, we're skipping equal? That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Read Matthew 15, 14 through 30, the parable of talents. What parts of this parable would our culture say are unjust? What point do you think Jesus was trying to make? Okay, I read that. Jesus was saying, I'll magically heal someone from a different race, but only if they answer my riddle. <laughs> like, was she throwing out a bluff with that Bible <laughs> verse? You think I wasn't going to fucking read it? And number three, ask your children. I love this one because it's so fucking evil. Ask your children if disagreeing with someone means you hate them. Recall examples of times when you and your spouse or family have disagreed but still loved each other reinforce that disagreement doesn't equal hate. I've never felt more sorry for her. Her advice here seems to be, but think of all the nice things daddy buys mommy afterwards, though. <laughs> God. And so now it's time for the discussion questions. Gentlemen, are you ready? Pass. <laughs> Number one, icebreaker. Look in the footnotes for the links to the Teen Vogue articles. Read them aloud and discuss your thoughts. No, 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 no. Why aloud? Does she think we're going to cheat? <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Cindy copied off mine. That's why we had to do it. <laughs> Two, main theme. When you ignore original sin as humankind's main problem, no solution you propose will work. Imagine telling your kids to do their chores for the good of all mankind. How effective do you think this would be? How do you think they would respond if you took away any rewards or allowances for performing their chores? What does that tell us about human motivation? Is this motive wrong? Why or why not? What do the following passages tell us about motives? See Corinthians 9 through 24, Corinthians 3, 8, Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Okay. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 says, if you're losing, maybe try winning. So I was like, okay, solid point. Solid point. You probably just warmed me up though. And she was 3 8 of 1 Corinthians says almost exactly from each according to his ability to each according to his needs as determined by God. <laughs> and that verse from Matthew says tolerating persecution 
is for the good of all mankind. Stop bluffing. <laughs> look up a quote that makes sense for your thing. I'm checking. Also, like, I I didn't get allowance for doing my fucking chores. What the hell is wrong with you, Hillary? <laughs> <laughs> Number three, self-evaluation. Most people long for a better life here on Earth. Are there times when you were tempted to think that money or economic policies are more important than the Holy Spirit's influence on society? Why do you think we are inclined to pursue other solutions before going to Jesus? Um, because people read 1 Corinthians 3.8 and they're a communist now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, because if we were all as dumb as you, we wouldn't have made it to the point where we could do language yet. Oh, all right. Uh, number four, <laughs> brainstorm. Read Acts 2, 44 through 47, and 4, 32 through 25. 32 How through 25? I don't think that's right. You have to read it oh. backwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like tenant. Yeah. You have to go right to left, <laughs> bottom to top. Yeah. yeah. How might a Marxist interpret the Bible as advocating for communism? Do you think it does? Uh, yeah, those verses say, be communist, God loves communism. <laughs> Almost exactly. That's yeah. what those say. Read Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the parable of talents. How could this parable be seen as advocating for capitalism? Do you think it does? Okay, that's the same one from before. It, it's <laughs> about making a poor Canaanite answer a riddle to get health care for her sick child. So, I mean, American capitalism, yeah, I guess it does advocate for that. <laughs> what can we learn by applying both principles advocated in scripture? Nihilism? <laughs> the cancel? Nothing? Number five, release the bear. Over dinner or during a long car trip, talk to your kids about what they think would happen if school had no grades or all the grades were averaged and distributed equally among students. What? Do they think students would work harder or less hard? Why? Read James 1, 27 and discuss it. Orphans and widows were people who had no protection or power in the Bible times. Ask your kids, who God has put in their path to serve. What is the difference between asking individuals to serve versus asking the government to serve on a nation's behalf? Which one puts more responsibility on the individual? Is this a good or a bad thing? <laughs> well, I guess that sure depends on whether or not you need help, huh? Oh, <laughs> motherfucker. Oh, and by the way, also, before you invite your kids to have that discussion, make sure that car trip is going to take you way the fuck out of Wi-Fi range so that they can't Google the kids learn better without grades. You fucking idiot. Why didn't you at least look that up? We know the answer to that. Jesus fucking Christ. And speaking of suboptimal learning strategies that people stick with despite mountains of evidence showing them counterproductive, we're going to read more of this dumbass book. So we're going to be back in a month with even more God awful books. Next chapter is about feminism. Oh, no. Yeah. Before we close the lid on this one, I want to let you know that if you can't get enough Eli in your life, you can catch more of him today on a live episode of Incredulous. It's recording at 7 p.m. UK time. I believe that's 2 p.m. Eastern. You'll be able to catch it live. Check at PIAT Pod or the Scathing Atheist Facebook page for links. If you miss it live, don't worry. We'll also have links to where you can watch it afterwards. Anyway, that's all the blast we've got for you tonight. But we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show, The Skeptocrat, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern time on Monday. An even newer episode of our sister show's hot friend, God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday. Tuesday, and an even newer episode of our Half Sister Show Citation D today being at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be a miserable piece of shit if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for being the scotch to my rocks, Eli Bosley for being the room temperature tomato juice to my, I don't know, like celery stalk, probably, maybe. I need to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Delusions, who will be back next week and misses you desperately. I also want to thank Amy, John, and Taylor for providing this week's Farnsworth quote back in the halcyon days of November of last year, when being a teacher in a large school system was nowhere near as terrifying. Thanks for doing what you do, guys, and I uh, hope you're keeping yourself as safe as you can. And most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best bipeds. It burns when I pee Novocaine, Sarah, Lucas, Ernest, Travis, Jerry, Kale, and Jonna. It burns when I pee Novocaine and Sarah, who give Hatari Hanzo swords sharpness envy, Lucas, Ernest, and Travis, who give the halls of the Overlook Hotel blood engorgement quantity envy and jerry kale and jonna who give quasar psoj 352.4034-15.3373 brightness envy it's it's the 
thing that came up when I googled brightest object in the universe. I, I, I mean, Jerry Kale and John probably already knew this on account of all their brightness, but I wanted to explain it to anybody else. Anyway, together, these nine naughty non-believers netted us a nugget of nourishment this week by giving us money. If you have money you want to give to us, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash getting atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not bad enough to go through all that shit, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATpod on Twitter. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson handles our social media. Our audio engineers, Martin Clark, will also roll the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. Happy birthday, Heath. Huh? It's, it's tomorrow. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> but this episode comes out tomorrow, so that That's I will have said it tomorrow. This, I got you present. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved.